this series of videos I'm attempting to repair and restore this HP 9845B vintage computer. In the previous video in this series I found a failed IC on the CRT interface board. That's the logic board on the left, on the left riser. And uh, I also found a fault on the uh, top logic board. That's the one that's actually inside the uh, monitor housing itself. That was just a fault with the board. It was a a through hole plating that had gone open circuit. So those two things were causing some weird uh, effects on the screen. And I've corrected those of course. I fitted a new IC to the left hand riser board and I'll move the camera so we can now see the monitor. Hopefully you can also see I've also dealt with the cataracts that were on the CRT. So I took the front cover off, took a uh, adhesive layer off, cleaned it up, reattached it and as you can see it looks a lot better. So I didn't video that, I've shown that before in previous videos but uh, this is just a before and after shot of the tube and what I'll do now is power this up, turn off the lights so you can see it a bit better And as you can see, it now boots up the way it should. Now it's not working, there's a lot of work to do yet. Um, the two memory cards don't work, the printer doesn't work, the in-out ports don't work. There are, and then the two tape drives of course, uh, will need a lot of work. So still a lot of work to do on this yet, so there's a long way to go in this series. So I've entered a quick program, we'll try and run that. And as you can see, it works just fine. So the next thing I want to look at is the printer and so I'll move the camera so you can see the printer control board. So the printer system is fed information from the PPU, comes to the printer control card, that's this card that I've got the logic analyzer attached to and then that controls the printer through this driver board which is in the right hand uh, leg going to the monitor. And uh, it doesn't work at all. The system doesn't seem. The printer system doesn't seem to be running. I've currently got the um, system configured to send all the data that we type in through to the printer. So I'll now try and enter something. You'll see what happens. So I've obviously got some paper loaded in. So as soon as you try and send anything to it, it just starts feeding out paper until you uh, tell it to stop doesn't print any characters and uh, clearly there's something not right with this so I need to investigate it. So far what I've done with this is attach the logic analyzer to the test connector on the uh, logic uh, printer logic control card and uh, I won't show that in this video because um, what I'm getting out of this is just nonsense. The, uh, the connector goes to the data lines and to the address lines amongst other things of the nano processor there's a separate microprocessor an HP specific processor on this board that's used to control the printer and uh, in theory we should be seeing the code that is in the control ROM on that board when we try and uh, run it and capture this on the logic analyzer but what I'm actually getting is this nonsense coming out of the system so it looks like the Nano processor is not running uh, at all, or the ROM has failed, or there's something wrong with the glue logic that's on this board. Now, I don't really know how the printer system works. I can't really find any information about uh, how the uh, the code in the control system is structured. It's basically a standalone uh, microprocessor system. Now, I do have the um, the file that comes out of the ROM for the nanoprocessor control system, just a binary file. And um, looking around I couldn't really find many uh, disassemblers for the HP nanoprocessor. Um, I contacted Ken Sheriff and he was uh, generous enough and kind enough to send me a copy of the one that he'd written. And that's the only one I could find anywhere. Uh, unfortunately it's written in Python which is not something I use so rather than go to the trouble of um, installing Python and getting that working as an interpreted language I had already looked into the possibility of writing my own disassembler 
The nano processor is very simple, it's got a very small instruction set and um, I started working on that shortly after I'd contacted Ken asking him if I could have a copy of his disassembler. And um, I'm in the UK, he's in the US and um, that was in the morning and by the afternoon, two or three hours later, I actually finished writing the disassembler. So uh, we'll go over to the PC and have a look at that and see what it spits out and then decide how we're going to proceed in trying to get this printer repaired. Okay. So over on the PC, I'm using Rad Studio XE6 for this. I've written this in C++ and a very straightforward uh, piece of software. The design is very straightforward. So it's just a small form, three buttons, a couple of file dialogues and a couple of edit boxes and a progress bar and a few labels. So we just open the source file, select a destination for our output, then process the file. It's as simple as that. The code itself is very straightforward. As I said, the nano processor is uh, very simple. It's got a very simple instruction set. There are a few oddities with it. Um, firstly, it uses uh, indexed addressing for some of the instructions and you would need to effectively write um, what would amount to an emulator if you want to do full, um, a fully qualified uh, jump um, profiling. So there's no way to easily determine the destination of some jump instructions, but that's not really what I need from this. I'm just looking for a general structure for the code. Direct jumps are fine. You can uh, two uh, byte instructions and you can easily calculate the destination of the address that you're trying to jump to. So the software is very straightforward. As I said, it's got a few helper functions. So firstly, we've got a decimal to hex conversion function. Uh, obviously, uh, I prefer working in hex when I'm looking at uh, things like ROM and source code. So I usually convert the values into hex. If you prefer, you could, of course, use octal. And um, we've got a button to uh, handle selecting a file to open. And then the main part of the code, it's a two pass disassembler. And it starts by going through looking for jumps and then creating a table of the jump destinations so that it can label them on the second pass. So that's fairly straightforward. It goes through anything that generates a destination address, puts the destination address um, table entry uh, value. It sets it so that um, later on when we do the second pass, we can determine if a particular address is the destination of jumps. It then goes back through, creates a heading in the output file, and then it goes through looking for the, um, the correct entry for each value it finds in the source file, handles it appropriately, and some are different. Most are very straightforward, as you can see. A lot of these instructions are very simple indeed. You could simplify this a lot more if you uh, created uh, a more structured way of uh, disassembling. But I prefer to do it this way and um, you end up with a very simple, easy to follow program. And um, I think there are 43 instructions in total, but obviously some can have parameters and some have a second uh, byte that uh, is used as a value, usually for an address destination. It uses a banked memory system, but again, it's very easy to calculate that each bank is uh, essentially 100 hex bytes in size, 256 bytes decimal. And so there's just one of these entries for each possible instruction. And as it processes this on the second pass, it um, enters labels and destinations for jumps. I also like to try and create a bit of a structure to the output file because of the way I use the files. One of the first things I do when I'm using somebody else's disassembler is to go through and try to separate subroutines. And it can be one of the most time consuming parts of the process. So I build that into um, my disassemblers, which is what I've done here. It's this entire thing probably took me two hours, two and a half hours to write and it can easily take you that long to go through the source code and just sort out what's a, a jump or a subroutine. 
So once we've done this, we can run the program, select the source file. This is the binary file for the printer, and then give it a name. I'll just leave it with a default. Process the file, that's now finished and we can open the file we've just created. And so this is what we end up with. It seems to make sense. The first instructions are to disable the interrupt, which is what we'd expect to find. And then it jumps to a subroutine. I've given the comments generic um, strings, but trying to make them as meaningful as possible. So for example, we have a jump to a subroutine and it says which, uh, which page it's on. Uh, and also it's replaced the address with a label. And these are the labels that we see for each of the jump destinations. This is why it's a two pass um, disassembler. So for example, 05DC is the destination for this uh, jump to subroutine. So if we go through and try and find that, okay, and here we have that label, 05DC. And this is um, structured in such a way that it's quite easy to see where the end of certain blocks of code are. So for example, a return from a subroutine has one of these dotted lines after it, so I can see where subroutines end. Now, of course, there are jumps within subroutines, so each of these doesn't necessarily mean this is the start of a subroutine. It could be a jump from within the subroutine itself or a jump into a subroutine uh, somewhere other than the start of the subroutine. But this does make the whole thing a lot um, easier to follow through. And uh, also on this particular processor, there does seem to be a trend from looking through it to put uh, NOP instructions at the end of uh, subroutines. So if we scroll through, we'll find that several of the um, ends or the return from subroutines have a NOP after them. And I'm assuming that's, um, so for example, this one. So as we can see here, we've got return from subroutine and it's followed by a no operation. So uh, again, in the disassembler, I've grouped these together rather than putting the knob at the beginning of the next block. I'm assuming it was padding at the end of the subroutine. So I've included it as part of the end of the subroutine. And the idea there is that um, code will jump through to here and not to here. Don't really know, I haven't checked it, but either way, it still makes it uh, fairly easy to read. So this is what we end up with, and hopefully I can now start to use this to uh, fault find on the printer. It's only a 2K file, so it's not particularly big, uh, but at least having this, I should be able to work through and see what the printer controller is actually trying to do. So we'll go back, look at the machine again. So in the next video, we'll start looking into this fault and uh, to get to this, unfortunately, this boards in uh, with the components facing that way. So we can't just put this on a riser and easily attach the logic analyzer because what I need to do, I'm getting nonsense out of this connector. What I want to do next is connect the logic analyzer directly to the ROM and see if it's a problem with the ROM itself or something else. But of course, I can't attach the logic analyzer like this. Normally, you just put this on a riser attach the logic analyzer using a clip, but we can't do that because the components are on the other side of this board. So what I need to do is um, take the monitor off, refit the risers, move the printer back down to where it's supposed to be, put this card, leave the monitor off, put this card onto a riser, and then connect the logic analyzer and see if we're getting uh, nonsense out of the ROM. So we'll do that in the next video. Um, but uh, once again, we've made a bit of progress.